I hope you are all aware. You know, thanks for staying awake. This is a healthcare presentation. And if you are not, you need to talk to me. Okay. So I come from healthcare, right? Um, this presentation, it's going to be different from what you have heard thus far. I can tell you that. Uh, most people think or don't think about risk. Almost every one of the presentations I heard today, and as, as well as yesterday, I can tell you this. Everybody talked about predicting something and leaving it there. Right? You don't do anything. Whereas in healthcare, the reason you do something is because you can manage it. Right? There is a risk involved in everything. That risk you want to manage, that risk you want to make money out of. For example, when you buy an automobile insurance, your insurer is covering some risk for you, right? That's, that's what it is. Similarly, health, health insurance risk and all that stuff. Um, I, I will take a slightly different tack on the whole thing. Uh, one thing you will see is that we have heard about uh, big data, right? People talk about big data like, you know, there's an infinite amount of stuff available, right? Take cancer, for example. No matter how much big data there is, you cannot increase the number of cancer cases, right? You are always limited by the amount of data you have on cancer. Um, you kind of feed data limit on how much data you can get. So I am going to basically take a stand here. It is not the amount of data, it is um, how many different sources of data you can get and how fast it is growing, meaning the relevant data, I am not talking about all the data that is relevant to you, the data that is relevant to you, how fast it is growing and how, how quickly it is available, right? that is what I am going to talk about. So this is basically roughly where I am, right? what is driving my presentation here, it is not anything, yesterday we were talking at lunch with some of the folks, what is driving the whole change in healthcare? That has not happened until now, right? Starting with the Obamacare, the number of uninsured, so many factors that are driving it, not to mention the whole risk paradigm is changing. Until recently, people used to say they are the payers making way too much money ripping off everybody, right? That's what they used to say. Now, anybody can take risk. In fact, the providers are taking risk, Samsung is taking risk, Target is taking risk, Walmart is taking assuming risk. Now, you and I are assuming risk. You know how? Now we have the big high directable health plans. We are the payers for the first five thousand dollars. Now the providers are competing for your money. They don't care about the payer that much anymore. Right? So much has changed. So I'm going to talk about the state of the healthcare market and what is the risk here? Whose risk are we talking about? The next thing is where is big data approach relevant? I'll describe an example. And this example is in the context of how a typical consulting firm approaches this. Right. When we go, we have our own tools, we have some data that we have in-house, we have some models built, we set it up in such a way that incrementally we can take it to one of our clients, take their risk, their data, bring other kinds of data, create the complete risk picture and then create an actionable plan for them. Right. I am going to present to you only one part of the puzzle. Right. Then I will talk about some use cases, how you, know, you can use this risk. Okay, what, what's new about the healthcare market? We are talking about the four P's. Each one of the things that you are looking at here is a data screen. It is personalized. If you, for example, until last week I was working in oncology, cancer, you know, with a large medical center in Texas. Then um, there, there is a program called the Moonshot program. You know, if, if you know MD Anderson, you know what it says in the logo? Making cancer history, you know, and then they delete the word cancer. From that. So, they have something called the Moonshot program. They have eight conditions. They don't want to kill them, they want to be done with them, they want to be rid of them. So, what they are doing is they want to take the data, get it into a database, get people into clinical trials, make the each treat therapy as individualized, and then they want to be done with that. No more of that. You know, there is certain kinds of solid tumors, certain kind of skin kind of tumors, all that stuff. You know, they, they want it gone. So, now the people are expecting more. In many conditions, they want the therapy to be personalized completely. They build all kinds of data, you know, genomics data, proteomics, uh, IHC data, everything, the immunohistory, stroke compatibility, complex data, everything. So now the, the therapy is in personalized. If you go to the next one, predictive, right? What they want next is, unlike cancer where the numbers are very small, in the case of other things, 
the numbers are big. Now they want to figure out, they want the physician to figure out where I as a patient belong in the category of diseases, meaning that am I a patient with you know, um, asthma uh, status, asthmaticus, which basically means I have really bad asthma. I want therapy categorized for my kind of patients. People are expecting more now. The next is preventive. Yesterday, the next two we are talking about, they are kind of interesting, they are relatively new, in the sense that because I am responsible for the first five thousand dollars of the money, now I am telling my doctor, don't just tell me how to manage my condition, tell me how I can prevent it for me and my family. That never happened before. It's happening now. The next one is the participatory. Because my dollars, my money, you know, I don't want to spend all of my $5,000, I want to spend only 2000 I want to keep the rest in my health savings account. So now, I want a participatory thing. You know, because I'm talking to you, now the, the patients are going, I'm talking to the provider, I'm saying, you know what, I'm going to give you $1,000, that's all I'm going to pay you, you take care of me. That never happened before. Now they are competing with the payer for a new risk population, right? So because of these things, what is happening? The risk is getting distributed. Those who are assuming risk, they are assuming lesser risk, but I mean, they are not, they are really worried about that. The providers are, on the other hand, they are in a fee-for-service model until now, right? More of the thing you did, you know, more money you got paid. Now they are saying we only pay this much money from the payer side and providers are taking the risk. They are responsible. If they don't deliver, they don't pay. They are just assuming the risk. And the third thing is the consumer. Me, I am I am assuming the risk. So I also want to know what the risk is. So the risk is everywhere. The risk I'm talking about here is risk of adverse events, risk of increased healthcare consumption, I'm talking about risk of all that kind. So in this changing healthcare system, it is important to talk about risk, right? Because not only am I, you know, being monitored, right? If I smoke, that data gets in, that data gets reported to the insurer. I'm being monitored, I get to pay more, more premium. And that data will also be used by everybody else to monitor my risk which they are assuming. Provider says please don't smoke. Right? So there are so many data sources available that were never used in healthcare before and they are getting to an interest and management. That's why big data seems a lot of importance. So what is the risk? I talked about it. You know, the risk from a payer perspective is how much money it costs me. From a, from a provider side, how much risk can I assume safely without going bankrupt? Right? That's what it means to the provider. Whereas for the family, how much risk can I actually push onto the other people? Right? To the provider, how much can I do that? So, the risk, the way it has been divided, by the, the thing, interesting thing about this is risk, is, risk is getting split all over the place. And everybody wants to know, what is the right kind of risk I can take, right? So, until recently, it was only the claims data, right? The payers used the claims data and said, this is how much money you have diabetes, you have some COPD, you have congestive heart failure, this is what your premium is. They had, let's say, 2,000 people in the employer group, my employer, they will complete the risk for every one of them, then calculate the average risk and say, you know, this is how much you are paying per member per month for the next 12 months. That's what they said. Now, in the new paradigm, they are using the data around the behaviors, the smoking behaviors, do I exercise, you know, do I live in a rough neighborhood where only restaurants around me are fast food restaurants, or do I live in a rural area where it is completely, I cannot get any healthy food. And all the people being fair into calculating the risk. That is big data. The other thing is the scalability issue. Risk bearing entities until now they basically waited for somebody to say, you know what, I want to buy insurance for you. Now what is happening is because of the way risk is getting split, the insurers want to know which is a good risk I can go after. So if I am, for example, let's say Blue Cross Blue Shield of California. I operate in California, but even if in California, I don't operate anywhere. Right? If you go to Humboldt County, where very few people live, probably Blue, Blue Shield does nothing about them. But they want to know now because they want to get them into it for walls. Now, the only data you have is not the claims, you have the behavioral data. What kind of food you eat, what kind of, you know, 
maybe marijuana they smoke or whatever it is, you know, they want to know about that. So the new kinds of data is being added to the risk estimation, right? The next part is the change from the fee for service model. Now the risk is being moved from the payer to the provider to the consumer. Because of so many risk stream data streams we are talking about, the we are actively advising our clients both on the payer, provider, even the allied side, Walmart. Walmart is a big one. You know, people don't realize that Walmart is a very good healthcare provider now. And they are keeping away the most profitable part of the healthcare spectrum. We have big provider of pharmacy and they provide the wellness benefits to everybody. The statistic is that 75% uh, of the American population lives within 5 miles of Walmart and that's their big market. And they are going after it, you know, big time. So, because of change from the fee for service model, everybody is affected and everybody wants to know who that consumer is. And that's why the new risk model is what we are talking about. If you have any questions, please feel free to raise it anytime. And then here is the big data, right? Until now, we talked about the claims. You know, we have the demographics and we have the claims. But then if you look at it, we have the third party data like Caritas, you know, we have Axiom and then we have the Pulse service and we also have custom service that we do, like, you know, we do the, um, what is it called? Mm -hmm. And then we do that. What's the binary thing we did? The binary service, the max fit, max fit service and things like that. You know, we do surveys of specific kind of segments and we bring them in. You know, we do that. And then we have the documents and we have the social media, of course, the Twitter and stuff. Right? Social media is used big time now. For example, most recently we saw a case of one of the people who was going for cosmetic gynecology surgery. And then um, they made a comment that I hope my prepare never figures out. You know, it is being built as a termination of pregnancy. You know, that's an obvious fraud, huge fraud. You know, things like that pick up now. Not only that, it's being used in the risk estimation. And most importantly, the NLP, the natural language processing of documents, that's being used big time. That's, that's one of the big projects that we do after now. So when you have all this structured to unstructured data, we have the patient behaviors, you know, let's say Caritas or the surveys, we have the claims cost from the payer, we have the drug R&D, pharmacy companies have a lot of their stuff, and the clinical data from the hospitals. We use all that information to actually come to the risk determination. Once we determine the risk, then we want to risk management. How can I manage it? Right? Once somebody is within your four walls, you have no choice but to keep them. So you have to manage the risk. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's where this uh, you know NLP comes in. Ah. Yeah, NLP is basically to take the medical documents and then we figure out what is the risky text in that. Yeah. We get it into the database and then we compute the risk. Yeah. So, if your doctor says that this person is likely to be asthmatic, you immediately look at this form of patients? Absolutely. Yes. Not just that, you know, all kinds of things they write. Right? This person is a farmer smoker. Yeah, we use that. What about the genetics? You know, the, on genetics, there is that new law which basically says we cannot use genetic data for risk profiling. Mm -hmm. We cannot do that. You know, there's a law. But if there's a family history, we will really use that. Yeah. So, the, the, pay attention to the first step there, right? I, I actually brought up this topic yesterday. The differently sampled data, I said, right? Differently sampled meaning the, the sample population is different that you use for risk modeling. The time period of the sampling is different. The frequency of sampling is different. On top of that, the intent of the sampling is different. If all four are different, how do you know the data is coming in? We have got to have well analyzed methods in order to use them in the risk modeling, right? That, that's where the big data actually goes, you know, it's a challenge for you. We extract the data, and then the way, and the other thing I told you about, this is one piece of the puzzle. One piece of the puzzle in the sense that we have tools, we have data, we have the models that we bring to the engagement, 
and then we get the data from our client and incorporate that into our risk modeling. So when we aggregate, we bring our own data, we we combine it with our data and as well as the client's data and any data they want us to use in terms of custom service because we do custom service for our clients and then we combine that. We extract the variables, the rest is different, right? We define the risk buckets, that's an important one. The risk buckets now are not the same as the ones we used before. Previous risk buckets were like maybe cost more or less. Now it is light. We have diabetes. We want to be called for diabetes, meaning we just look at diabetes. Yes. Meaning there are people who are patients who are coming to us basically saying, I want a health plan just only for my diabetes, I can manage the rest. So we are now underwriting only risk for specific conditions. I'm assuming that these are all public like, exposed profiles that yes. you're not doing anything with. What is in that list that people should be aware of? Because I feel like NSA should be going to my health records. They do. <laughs> I mean, I'm, just, no, but I'm, I'm, trying, I'm just trying to understand is that what is in that, uh, you know, what are the other public sources that you look at? You look at? I mean, these are just. Uh, obvious candidates, but what else? There are blogs, there are private blogs, there are the patient forums, you know, people who want this. Yeah, the all that stuff is publicly available. Yeah. Who's bringing your own data? Mm -hmm. Is it the professional? Are you just, uh, is it the CK available? Is it the public data? Can you copy your own data? No, it's, it's property in the sense that, see, much of the data is available, nobody has combined it for our risk modeling. No, what we do is we go to specific people and say get this data from there, there and there because they won't give the original data source to us. We are only interested in the output of that, that model, right? So we basically tell them, you know, get that data, you know, um, collapse it for us and we take that data out of client. So it's not publicly available. We pay for it and we it. We don't get the data. We don't get the data. We just exactly. Yes. Yes. No, I mean not only that. We, we have our own sources in the sense that. Let me give you a very very simple example. Right? I'm sure you will understand. There's a there's let me imagine a consulting company. Right? Consulting company is considered neutral. And let's say there are three competing players. Let's say. Walmart, Target, and uh, let's say CVS. They figure their formula is becoming more and more expensive, their margins are thinning. So what they want to do is, they want to consider merging their sourcing. They don't want to share their data with each other. Walmart doesn't want to do it with Target, they don't want to do it with CVS. On the other hand, they're okay with that. We, each one of them sharing the data with us. So then what we do is, we can combine the data, but we won't tell each one of them what we know about the other. Right? Then we have that data, we can take it to the consulting. And we pay for that data. Going back to the link in the supply chain, yeah. if Rama gets this great company, pharmaceutical companies, we also provide the uh, Yes. I mean, yes, we do. So we go all the way to the back, to the animal space. Yeah. Sure. So finally, you know, we develop the we, we, we develop the risk profiles. We compare the risk profiles. We advise them about you know who their competitor is, you know where they should be playing, where their niche is, and where is still the opportunity. Again, there are some companies even though there is an opportunity, they are not quick enough. But the opportunity disappears fast. So we know how fast they move, and we tell them you know what's your likely investment you actually make it. Right. We also advise them on that. So we compare, you know, what the risk profiles are and what the opportunities are, and then we tell them, you know, the products and the communication channels to the different stakeholders, the consumer, the provider, the payer, the pharma, and all the allied payers which are making big money now, like Walmart, Samsung, you know, Google, they are going to so oh, they are big, they are in big. GNC, GNC and also now all the, what's that, homeopathy, naturopathy, oh, all of them are in big. Yeah, absolutely, they are all in. In fact, uh, one of the things that we look at in the health profiles, you will see that in the next one here, you will see that in the psychographics and health and what you say drugs. So if you actually look at that, um, if somebody, okay, this, this is a simple example probably everybody will understand. Let's say somebody is, is depressed 
you know, they are, they are, they think they are okay, but every day they consume what's that? The coffee cereal which are St. John's Wort in it. St. John's Wort is an antidepressant. So technically they are taking the drug. So if somebody is eating that cereal and they are feeling happy, you know what the word that I have to say. Yes. Oh, definitely. Alcohol, definitely. Oh, yes. Can you talk just for a second about that model? Which elements of that are iterated in nature and what kind of time frames are involved cascading through the model? You know, in, you mean going down that funnel? Are you asking? Yeah. Okay. See, the, the first part is static. Not all of it is static. But then we sample often. You know, like we update our models like every quarter, you know, every six months, depending on that. So, and then to that you see, for example, on the, the box on the right, I hope you can see that, right? The box on the right, um, it talks about the different buckets, the age income, IP, you know, that's the different, you know, provider access patterns that we have, right? And then on the left you have the income. What we have seen from our correlations is that people who have more discretionary income are likely to seek health care. So we know that, not necessarily the sicker ones. And then what we have also seen is the purchasing pattern. Somebody buys a, you know, what's that, Nike shoe, Adidas shoe, you know, they take care of themselves. And there are people, you know, who go to this, consume um, vitamins, for example, they tend to, tend to take care of themselves. And then people who eat, like, you know, people believe in six small meals in a day, those kind of people, you know, they, they take care of them. So we know. <laughs> exactly, who take care of them, takes care of themselves, and there are people who don't. And then, depending on where you live, for example, the blighted neighborhoods in Detroit, you know, um, Dodge City, you know, places like that, where they are surrounded by fast food restaurants, we know what the risk profile is. You know, we, we regularly target, for example, there is something called Project Dog that we are, we are working on in Texas right now. This, this focus on the diabetes and obesity, you know, we are working on that. So all this is based on this kind of modeling. Now we don't just look at the plain data, we look at every single piece of data. I mean, if, if, you, if you didn't believe really until now that we don't, this is proof that we all do. Everybody has access to this data. So, the, there's something called the Healthy Living Index, I should tell you about that. What that is, is basically uh, expected consumption of resources based on the health state. So, if somebody is healthy and then they have a good uh, attitude towards health, how they take care of themselves. Uh, they run, they have a good lifestyle, they are, they are relaxed, you know, how, much, how they manage stress if they have a sleep problem. And if they have a sleep problem and they smoke, if they have a sleep problem and they drink, you know, obesity, the treatments, how many unsuccessful weight loss therapies they have, right? all that stuff, right? So, depending on that, we come up with something called the Healthy Living Index. Where the Healthy Living Index means more resources they will come in, in the short term to medium term. And that's what's important for a you know, risk estimation process. And we take all that into consideration. So at the end of that, right, um, we, we have the predictors, the final model, and then we come up with the you know, estimation of the risk. Once we have the estimation of the risk, then we talk about you know, the risk that we can take on. Meaning all risk is not bad. Meaning as a, as a somebody who takes on this, let's say I'm a player. All risk is not bad for me. The good risk for me is where I get more premium that I make it pay less. That, that's good risk. I'm trying to get the youngest people who give me the more premium. I'm trying to get people whose risk is well known, I can estimate. And then I want to get more premium and I help you. And that's what we are trying to do. Any questions on this? You know, the, the, we just to talk, talk about the models. We use all kinds of models. You know, we use the starting from the regular regression, logistic regression, of course, then we use simulations to help them figure out over a period of time how much money they can make depending on what kind of interventions they do. So we use Monte Carlo simulations, stochastic simulations, and things like that. We do all that. Now here is the health risk landscape. You know, this is, this is the kind of decisions our clients make. Right. For example, if you look at counties, right, especially from the Medicare perspective, all the Medicare risk is underwritten on a county basis. You know, unlike you or me, 
it's done on an individual basis, here it's done on a county basis. So if you look at this, there are some regions which are green and they have, you know, higher prevalence of Medicare and Medicare, you know, they have households, but they have a lower risk. Those are the kind of, you know, people you want. So if that's what you want to go after, we can help. Zero in on that risk, I'll tell you what to do. Right? Uh, this is the first step in the process, what I'm showing you. Next, the next thing is, um, the other side of the, looking at the behavioral side, is this, right? If, 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 I, if, if my player knows I'm smoking, my player also knows I need smoking cessation program. If my player knows I'm not sleeping well, my player also knows I need to do a sleep management program. Right? So now we, can, we have products which are actually designed for the risk that needs to be managed. It's not suddenly just about, you know, here is the risk, you collect the premium and you are done. Now, have players are creating new products, like there is a diabetes benefit design which basically covers specific things about diabetes and then provides community resources like, for example, instead of saying the physician is the center of your healthcare management, now they are saying it is a pharmacist because a diabetic visits the pharmacist much more often than they visit the physician, right? And the other thing that has been found is uh, if a, a diabetic does every single thing that the American Diabetic Association says the person has to, you know, two, uh, two physician visits, one, two, two blood tests, one foot exam, one eye exam, if they do every single thing in a year, the risk is, you know, still undermanaged. It's not, because there's a lot that happens between that, right? So now they are saying it's the pharmacist. So now they actually send the person to the pharmacist and basically say, are you exercising? You know, this is where the nearest part is. You should take your dog for a walk. So, that's how clearly the risk is being managed now. And now, the, the last one is looking at the specific populations, design appropriate targeted intervention strategies. By that, what I mean is, it's not about just having a diagnosis. Di diabetes is a diagnosis, right? There is three diabetes. Acute diabetes is, you know, diabetes is A1C of 6.45, greater than 6.4. And anybody between 5.8 and 6.4 is considered pre-diabetic. And the statistic is, every year 11% of them, if you do nothing, 11% of them want to develop diabetes in one year. If you, on the other hand, you do an intervention, only 4% of them do. So, there is 7% that you can actually reduce in terms of risk, right? So, uh, by actually intervening on the whole population, meaning if you have 100 patients and 11 of them want to become diabetic every year, and you can prevent 7 of them being diabetic in one year by doing intervention on all the 100, most of the 100, then you can actually manage the risk very well. So, the way it's being done now is looking at where the people go in the community, YMCA for example, they are saying YMCA is a big healthcare provider, people don't realize that now. YMCA, YMCA provides healthcare, uh, you know, weight loss programs, they provide uh, obesity management and they also go to the family level and actually give them the exercise. They are a big healthcare provider. The other thing is the people where they spend time watching TV. Now um, Comcast is hearing pre-diabetes management programs on the internet and uh, I mean on the on campus TV on the cable to the cable is connected the uh, weighing machine which actually collects as soon as you start watching the program it collects your weight and it actually transmits to the power so they know what you are doing and then if you do things right you get an insight to your premium in the radio so, they are working on that. So, we help players using the risk plan state, you know, the risk plan state develop better programs so they can take on good risk and manage the risk better as well. Going further down on this, right, um, look at this, you know, I am pointing to, point to, to you a particular county. Can anybody recognize that, that arrow, which county that is? And if you are from Southern California, you know, it is the Riverside County. Yeah, Riverside County, the specialty is, as it, there's a big urban, there's a small urban part and there's a huge rural part, actually I've grown it out there. Right. Right. Hardly anybody lives there, but look at the color of that risk there. 
that risk is completely right, which basically means those people, even if you do very well on this side, you know, risk, your margins, you know, insurance companies operate on operate like grocery markets, their margins are 1%. Even if 100 people don't take care of themselves, their margins can be completely gone. So, we are helping them actually create um, intervention programs whereby the physicians don't want to leave there because it's not profitable for a physician to leave and take care of anybody. Now we are helping the payers and the providers create telemedicine programs so you can actually interact with the risk and manage that risk. Right, that never used to happen before, now it will happen. And all this is because of big data. Because we didn't have data before, now we are using not the claims data, because most of those people, they actually go, they work during summer and for the winter they go to Mexico, you never see them. So now we know where they live and how to get the data, no matter how, irrespective of where they live, including Mexico, now we know how to manage their risk and how to take care of them. So we help the payers develop better uh, provider network, better provider outreach, and also we talk about how to define uh, better products. So that's what we are doing. So this is just from the risk perspective, right? Um, which touches you, me, and everybody else. So going to the last part of it, risk has further implications for everybody. So one is, um, you know, risk determination, identifying the preferred risk, understanding the needs and preferences of the customer, right? That's the first row, first row. Below that, you know, we are talking about, we have a good provider network, you know, I'm talking about the, the bottom there, and we are talking about, do they, are there, custom, you know, good care, care management services, do I need to create something special outside of the provider, because we constantly hear that, somebody said that yesterday, you know, there are uncle and patient blogs where we talk about, you know, my provider has no time to listen to me, they write a blog and we can get that information and use that. And then finally, the most effective channels of you know, customer intervention. There are people who say, I don't watch TV, so you can't use them to TV. But they, they like their mobile phone, you can use them to the mobile phone. So we are looking at all that stuff. So let me stop here. Right?